In this video, we will be taking a look at ESRGAN, which builds on the previous implementation and uh, the previous walkthrough of SRGAN uh, that I recommend that you check out before uh, taking a look at this one. But so, uh, in this video, we'll be taking a look at the paper, and then the next video, we'll implement uh, this in PyTorch. So, ESRGAN stands for Enhanced Super Resolution Generative Adversarial Networks. Um, and essentially, you know, um, it builds on the, you know, the work of SRGAN, which was able to uh, generate realistic textures during single image super resolution. But there was a problem, which is that there were some um, unpleasant artifacts, and that was associated with what they found to be with batch norm. And also, they just did things that just made the quality better. Um, but so they study three key key um, three key components of SRGAN, which is the network architecture, the adversarial loss, and the perceptual loss. And so they made some improvements to all three, and then they have this enhanced SRGAN. And so for the architecture, they use a residual in residual dense block RRDB is what they call it. Um, and we'll see the details of it, but it doesn't use batch normalization. Uh, and they also, instead of um, for the loss, they use something called a rel relativistic GAN, uh, which lets the discriminant predict relative realness instead of the absolute value. And then they also do a very minor thing, which is um, change the VGG perceptual loss to be um, before activation, so before the ReLU instead of after. <laughs> and... I guess that, that works better. And um, yeah, so I'm going to go through the important details of this. But here's perhaps one example we can see that they shown that show that ESRGAN has some better texture than SRGAN. Here they do look to be a bit better. And yeah, so I'm going to skip these introductory parts because we want to just see sort of what they did. So the proposed methods that they did is that they... Uh, they still use the basic architecture of SR ResNet that they use in SRGAN, uh, where you know the most computation is done in the low resolution feature space because we kind of do the um, you know so so sort of at the end here is when we actually do the upsample, right? So here we do a bunch of computation on this low resolution image and then we uh, upsample it in the end. Now, um, so. This is actually not entirely true that they mention here is that they employ the basic architecture of SR ResNet because they, they change sort of major things, I would say, in the implementation. Um, and I'll, I'll go through it later on, but, um, you know, the paper doesn't mention some key details that they changed, but it's visible in the source code, right? Um, which I kind of felt was, I don't know, it was, just didn't feel right. But so they should have definitely mentioned those in, in the paper, I feel like. But anyways, we'll get to those. But so the network architecture, uh, they remove all the background layers and they also remove the original basic block with the proposed uh, RRDB block. And so what how it works is that, you know, in the beginning we have com batch norm, relu com batch norm. They remove the batch norm and then they uh, essentially uh, one of those residual blocks is now one of these blocks, all right, where one of those blocks contains three dense blocks and one dense block contains all of this stuff. So, you know, they it's going to be a much, much larger network. In, in Like, it's in pretty much insanely much larger than the SRGAN. Because, you know, so this is one residual block. And they, they use 23 of these ones, right? So you can imagine 23 of these um, where you sort of have run it through a dense block and then you use a residual connection here um, to to the sort of the main path, right? And the main path is, is this in the center here. Um, but so uh, that is what they do for one RRDB block. And then one dense block, they do it uh, with a com relu com relu, com relu, com relu, and then conv. And so what's kind of the key here, I guess, is that they also do these um, these skip connections between all of the different paths. So in the beginning here, they do a skip connection to after the first um, sort of pair of com relu, second, third, and also the other one. So, 
sort of an all to all um, in the path forward where they do skip connections. And also here is, um, I guess it, it comes from DenseNet where they, instead of doing uh, a skip connection where they element wise uh, sum them, they do a, um, uh, a concatenation. So all of these ones, right, are a concatenation of, uh, of the channels. So yeah, I guess that will also become clear when we go actually implement it in the next video, but that's what they do. Um, and that's what they, yeah, the major change to res the residual block. So you can imagine, you know, this is you know a lot, lot bigger because in the beginning they, so SRGAN had 16 of these RB blocks, right? 16, uh, where we had, I guess, two comb layers. Now we have 23 of these where we have three times, I guess, five, so 15, right? So 23 times 15 versus 16 times two. You know, that, that's a big difference in the, in the um, number of comb layers that they actually use. Okay, so um, I guess one other detail as well, um, which is kind of interesting, which they mentioned in the appendix, is that these residual connections here, um, th those are actually um, element-wise um, sort of standard skip connections, but they do an interesting thing, which is that they use a, um, a beta residual scaling parameter. So they, they, uh, they don't just do sort of... Um, I guess, you know, X plus uh, residual, they actually do X plus the residual. Um, let's see. So yeah, so they do the one that goes through the dense block, right? Um, so perhaps, you know, this would be X then that goes in the main path. They times the residual, the one that's gone through this dense block by a beta parameter, beta, which is equal to 0.2. So that is interesting because that means that uh, we're sort of taking the main, the, the one that was from the beginning before running through this dense block is what we kind of uh, sort of prioritize, I guess, because we take one times that amount and then 0.2 times the amount that has gone through the dense block. Um, and they sort of um, intuitively mention that uh, this is that the, this, the the one going through the dense block will modify the initialization uh, to be, I guess, correct or whatever. But that is some, just an interesting part of it. Um, and yeah, so they mentioned here that when the statistics of training and testing data sets differ a lot, batch room layers tend to introduce in unpleasant artifacts, which is uh, what, I meant, uh, what I observed as well when uh, training SRGAN, uh, is that there were just some random artifacts that just appeared randomly during training and stuff. And particularly when you would have some some odd looking image, like there would be some 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 image with a with a black background, for example, that could you know uh, introduce these artifacts as well. So one thing that I felt I want, didn't want to miss is that you know this is what they mentioned to be the the change in the architecture, but they actually did some different things as well, which they didn't they weren't clear on um, that could you know impact the performance a bit. I would say. So I'm going to show you the code and we can just see some, some differences that they did there. So here is the, uh, the source code for ESRGAN that they have in the, in, the, uh, in the paper. And this is just for the generator architecture because the, the code is kind of massive to go through. But just looking at the generator, all right, we can see that, um, for example, if we look at, let's see, the all right, so if we look at the, the entire network here, the RRDB net, which is the generator, for example, we can see here that they use a kernel size of one, stride of one, padding of one, which they didn't do in SRGAN. They used a kernel size of nine in the beginning um, and padding of four. Um, and, and also for the last one, they also here used a kernel size of three. So another big thing is that they used pixel shuffle in SRGAN, but in ESRGAN, they use an f dot interpolate, um, where so they do an, uh, sort of a, a nearest neighbor upsampling, which is also quite different, right? Um, so those are definitely things they should mention in the paper, in my opinion. So that is one key part, and the other is the rel relativistic discriminator, and you know I haven't seen much about this in other papers, so this is kind of the first time that I've seen this actually. Um, and 
I'm not really sure if it's that important. Um, I think, you know, y using vegan GP or something would probably give similar results. And uh, in fact, their implementation did, um, did also have a vegan GP, which they tried with. Um, and I, I think they mentioned that they, it was just sort of, um, it took longer time, but it didn't give significant improvement but it doesn't seem to do anything that was worse. But yeah, so the idea is that, um, and again, I'm going to skip this a little bit because, you know, I'm not really too familiar with this, but uh, the idea here is anyways that, you know, this is the standard again, where we just do sigmoid of the output from the from the discriminator. And, you know, similarly for the, the fake ones. So the real one should be one, the fake one should be zero. But here um, for the relativistic GAN, they instead do sigmoid of the output, so the one that you know is over here, uh, but they do subtract with the expected value of the of the sort of uh, the fake images. So we run through the discriminator of the fake images, and then we take the torch dot mean of that. So we take the mean value of the fake across the batch that we currently have, and we subtract that with the um, uh, with with sort of the um, the output of of the real one from the discriminator, and yeah, I guess I don't want to go into more detail. I don't feel that this is super important, but that's one also key part that they used. Um, and um, so the standard discriminator in SRN can be expressed as dx is sigmoid of cx, where sigmoid is a sigmoid, <laughs> where sigmoid is yeah, and c of x is the non-transform discriminator output. Um, and yeah, and then they mentioned some part about the, the loss function that they use here. And then, uh, the perceptual loss, which is, you know, this is kind of funny. Like the only difference here is, uh, that they used it before activation of the ReLU. And so, um, yeah, so we develop a more effective perceptual loss by constraining on features before activation rather than after activations as practiced in SRGAN. So what this means kind of like concretely is that, VGG, um, you know, in, in the implementation of SRGAN, we did VGG.features, I think, and then that brought it into a list and we did up to 36, right? Uh, the thing that's different now is that we have to do, we need to change that to a five. <laughs> so that is the difference uh, in the perceptual loss. And then uh, the total loss, um, and yeah, so one big thing as well is that they included the L1 loss during training which we kind of discussed for SRGAN, wasn't really clear if they used that because it seemed like they replaced uh, the, um, the, the L2 loss in, in their case uh, with an a VGG um, sort of a feature perceptual loss. But here, so I guess they do two things here. They first introduced this L1 loss um, and then they also uh, have it main, uh, sort of kept during training. So when they add the actual uh, perceptual loss. So now they have three loss terms, one for the perceptual one, which is VGG, or yeah, when it's run through VGG. Then we have one for the relative, um, the relativistic GAN, which is multiplied by this 5e minus three constant. And then we have this other term for the L1, um, and that is multiplied by one e minus two. Yeah, so then they also, yeah, they mentioned those things that I just said, which is that this is the, um, the L1 loss, and then we have these constants. I feel like they, they didn't mention the constants here. They mentioned them, them later on, but it would have been clearer if they would have just said the constants here when they actually introduced these, uh, uh, that, these loss terms. But so if we move along, uh, they also use another trick which is in network interpolation. So, um, yeah, I have some comments about this, but they mentioned that to remove unpleasant noise in, in GAN-based methods while maintaining a good perceptual quality, we propose a flexible and effective strategy in network interpolation. So what they do is that they take, a, they train in a GAN um, for PSNR, meaning they only train the generator on an, an L1 loss or an L2 loss, um, but so they train it on, I think, L1 loss, and then they train the, um, the GAN when they introduce this, this uh, discriminator and this additional loss terms for the perceptual loss. 
and then they do an inter interception of those two um, where they take some constant times the GAN weight, all right, and then they take another one minus that constant times the um, the weight of the one that was only trained on L1. And in that way, they um, found to, to uh, remove unpleasant noise. So I'm not really sure what they mean by unpleasant noise. Um, hopefully that doesn't mean artifact because that was the reason why we introduced, uh, why we removed batch norm. Um, so let's see, wait. Um, first interpolated model is able to produce for any feasible without introducing artifacts. Yeah, okay, so yeah, I kind of missed that, but without introducing artifacts. So that is, I think, what they mean, <laughs> which is unfortunate, right? right? Because then you question the um, the the fact of in, of removing the batch norms. If you still have these artifacts that you're gonna now have to solve with network interpolation, so yeah, this kind of felt like they mentioned that yeah we remove batch norm which solved the artifacts, but then you come to this part and they say we introduce an additional network interpolation because it removed artifacts. But then, you know, the question is, why they, they didn't, I thought you removed those. So, you know, honestly, um, this, um, I kind of uh, have some doubts about this paper because they're like the code and paper doesn't always match. And the, I don't know, in my opinion, there are some things that could definitely be improved on this and to make things clear. Um, but yeah, let me know if you have any thoughts. And then also, all right, so then they also, the training details, they mentioned that we obtained low resolution images by downsampling high resolution images using the MATLAB bicubic kernel function. And so this this doesn't make sense to me either. You know, they used PyTorch. You can you can um, down downsample using PyTorch and definitely there exist libraries for that. Why did you do it in MATLAB? Um, and they also mentioned sort of in the in the in their GitHub source code that um, you might not receive the same results as we do if you trained us from scratch, uh, if you do not use the MATLAB by cubic kernel function. And then, you know, I don't know, there, at least there should be some comments added as to why they did that and sort of why it's that important, I guess. So what is the difference between MATLABs and TorchVision? All right, and then they also mentioned that the mini batch is set to 16, same as SRGAN. Um, and then they also, they used a higher uh, patch of 128. They actually did even higher than that. So they did 198 as well. But so 128, uh, where SRGAN used 96 by 96. So they mentioned that we observed that training a deeper network benefits from a larger patch size. Um, since an enlarged receptive field helps to capture more semantic information. And I guess that makes sense. Um... Yeah, I guess that makes sense. And then they mentioned that the training process is divided into two stages, similarly as SRGAN. They train the PSNR with L1 loss, and then they have some details uh, of the learning rate and mini batch updates, which is nice. Um, and then they, um, yeah, the, the generator, so then they employ the PSNR as initialization, for, just as SRGAN did. And then it's trained with this new loss function. And here they introduce the, the constant terms that we looked at um, uh, over uh, before. And so they use one E minus four learning rate and then they half them after every 50K update steps. They also mention here that they use Atom, same beta one and beta two. And they use, um, they use one that has 16 residual blocks, which is what SRGAN did. And then uh, they had one uh, with 23 blocks, which is the one that they use mainly. So the one with 23 is what they use mainly. Um, but I can, I, it also f doesn't feel correct to compare those residual blocks of SRGAN and ESRGAN. As we saw, the, the difference is massive, uh, you know, in the amount of comm layers that they used. Um, you know, they they kind of completely changed the architecture. They, they, yeah. Anyways... So for training, they use div 2k dataset, and they also use Flickr 2k dataset. Um, they mentioned that they empirically find that using this large dataset with richer textures helps the generator to produce more natural results. 
and uh, here they also mentioned that they use uh, horizontal flip and 90 degree uh, random rotations. All right, so let's go down. Maybe there are some other stuff. So, yeah. Right, I think I just wanted to go to the appendix now to look at some details here. Um, yeah, here they talked about bash room artifacts. Um, and then, and yeah, so this is kind of what it looked like randomly during training sometimes for, um, for SRGAN. And let's see, so, right. Yeah, so I wanted to mention that with the residual lear learning where they, um, they use um, basically that they multiply the one that has gone through the block with a very, so 0 0.2 constant. And then they keep the one that was originally um, sort of with a constant of one. So we mentioned here that it scales down the residual by multiplying a constant between zero and one. Um, in our settings, we, for each residual block, the residual features after the last convolution layer are multiplied by 0 0.2. Intuitively, the residual scaling can be interpreted to correct the improper initialization, thus avoiding magnifying the magnitudes of input signals and residual networks. And, uh, you know, I'm not really sure how much I buy into this, ma uh, you know, actually mattering. I wonder if you could just do sort of a normal one without multiplying with 0.2. But yeah, that is, I guess, one detail of what they did. All right, so in the next video, I'll try to implement this one and uh, we'll see exactly how it looks like and the details of its implementation. But hopefully this leaves you with a, uh, in a solid understanding of ESR GAN, sort of um, the, the update of the network and the uh, relativistic GAN and also um, other things. Um, yeah, I think one thing I actually missed also is that um, they they also mentioned here, um, I thought I me, um, took that part, but they also said that they found that smaller initialization um, worked well in their experiments. So they actually, um, in the source code, they multiply with a scale of 0.1 of the original initialization weights. Um, so yeah, that is just one thing also to, to keep in mind, but... I'll go through that in the implementation as well. All right, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.